destined to be conformed to the image of His Son. He predestined us to be conformed to the image of His Son. Now the beauty of this concept of being like Christ, it's actually what we would be like. So how do we get there? What are the necessary steps to be like Christ? And when you break it down, it's very overwhelming. So do I start loving everyone in my neighborhood? Do I start washing people's feet on the street? Do I try to start hanging out in bars and telling them parables of the kingdom of heaven? Where do I start in this process? In orthodoxy, there's actually a very drawn out process. It goes from level to level where the three levels kind of go together. The first level in our growth towards union with God is actually called purification. The second level is sanctification and the third level is illumination. Now, Illumination, then sanctification. Okay, so it's purification, illumination, then sanctification. Um, purification is absolutely necessary. You can't just jump to the final stage, which is a lot of time what we're trying to do. Um, we can't just begin to be holy and start acquiring the virtues without first being purified. So purification is getting rid of the bad stuff first. I found this quote and I like it. Life is like a beautiful garden. Remember to pull out the weeds and water the flowers. A lot of us are thinking about becoming like Christ, just watering the flowers. But have you ever seen a garden that has these beautiful flowers and then weeds all over? You just wouldn't appreciate the garden unless it got rid of the weeds. So I can't be loving like Christ and yet still be angry. I can't still be holy and lustful. I can't seek to save others when all I care about is myself. So last week we spoke about repentance. And this came up in our discussion group last night on repentance. How often does it come up in your minds that you need to repent? I mean, how often, when was the last time you had that thought that I need to repent? It should be in our minds daily, but even more frequently than that. The idea of wanting to repent and change and remove the weeds and get rid of the sins should be on our minds constantly. Constantly getting rid of weeds. Now what we realized in our discussion yesterday is that we tend to focus on the big things. We repent and times when we feel like we fell into a big sin. When we lost it in a conversation that we had with someone, we criticized someone and we really tore into them and we really hurt them. You know the times where you throw a shoe at a dog? Sorry, I don't know where that came from. Like in traffic, like we're in the midst of uh, lots of cars. And our minds turn into this foul bowl of alphabet soup, forming every four-letter word known to man. Sorry, I don't know where that came from. Now, here's the problem. This is ugly. And when you see this in your yard, you want to get a machete, and you want to just whack it to death. This is the problem with that picture and how we often deal with repentance. It occurred to me that oftentimes we wait for the sin to get really big before we do anything about it, like that weed. And number two, we aim at the part that we can see, but not always the root. We wait for the sins to get really big before we decide to repent. You may not confess the first time you begin to envy someone. They're talented, they're wealthy, they're physically beautiful, or they have just a nice, mellow dog. I I don't know where that came from. Okay, It, it grows into desiring more, becoming self centered, 
Sometimes wanting bad things to happen to that person. That maybe they would lose what they have. Maybe you get angry with them. Maybe you gossip. Maybe you destroy their reputation. Maybe you make them lose all their friends and you rejoice at their troubles. And then you say, I should confess. First time a lustful thought comes, we say, oh, I'll get over it. But the thought makes you want to look at pictures. And they say oftentimes it starts off with looking at like lingerie ads. Not terrible, maybe. But then those go on to something else like complete pornography. And then there's an addiction. And then we're trapped. And then we constantly feel guilty. And then we confess. And one of our issues is that we don't consider small sins to be a big deal when they really are. We say, oh, those are just small sins. And we don't really make a big deal about them. But when you look at what Christ said, He says, you have heard what it was said of old, you shall not commit adultery. And if any of us committed adultery, we would probably confess. But He says, but I say to you, whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. He recognizes the final outcome, the adultery, the murder, that it's a process. That it doesn't just start there. It starts when the sin is small. And so Christ's command is, when you have that thought, cut it out from there. And I guess what I'd like for you to think about is for us to think of small sins. I want you to label them as ugly, soul-killing acts of disobedience. I want you to think of them like flesh-eating bacteria, like viruses that can spread rapidly and lead to severe illness, even death. See, we don't think of the small sins that bad. We let them go. We accept them. Just like a small virus or a bacteria. And initially, you don't mind it. It's not until it's become out of control that you say, I've got to do something about it. Sin is so ugly to God even the small ones even the small ones are ugly to Him why do we have to wait till they become more now um, sorry I'm going to use it a little bit out of order some weeds get really big and they really put up a good fight three of my greatest enemies are weeds in my backyard. They're so stinking big that whenever I try to get them out, they've got such large roots, um, I can't get them out of the ground. And so I decided to buy a new gardening outfit. It's the one you see above. Because those weeds are there. They're big, hairy, ugly, smell, foul-smelling weeds that I can't get rid of. And so I feel like I need this kind of armor in order to attack them. And we can't just ignore the weeds and water flowers when we've got weeds like this. And even then with that outfit, when the weeds look like this, it's still pretty scary. The other problem is that we're trying to get rid of the sins that we see. Even when a small, even when the weeds are small, when you don't dig deep enough, you don't get the root out, they come back. Oftentimes we, we look at the final outcome of the sin, but we don't realize why the sin is there. There's this whole genre of the fathers where they talk about spiritual diseases, and they're amazing at analyzing the root cause. A lot of them have to do with selfishness, or maybe low thoughts of ourselves. They lead to ambitions, which we'll talk about. Maybe they're from a prior injury to our souls, to our lives in the past, that lead to these sins. 
And it's really important. If you were to look at this picture, which is jaundice, and you're the physician, you could say, okay, I think I know what we should do. We're going to get a different bronzer. We're going to get you a really long sleeve shirt. And we're going to give you sunglasses and no one will know that you've got this jaundice. We're going to cover it up. But what is at the root of the problem? Is that there's a pancreatic cancer that's spread all over this guy's abdomen and it's killing him. And yet what we've done is we've taken care of the outside and we haven't gone to the root of the problem. And so what happens if you cover up the jaundice? And you give the anti-itching cream and the itching goes away. You want to know what happens? The person still dies. And you say, okay, well, I'm going to stop, you know, the big sin. But you haven't taken it out from its root. So it's going to come back. So I guess what I'm trying to get at is this. Don't just focus on the big sins. Maybe we're not committing the big sins. You say, okay, I'm probably not going to kidnap anyone this week because I can barely handle my own kids. And I'm not going to rob a bank this week because all my artillery is being used up for my garden. So I'm good. But I want you to look at this verse. This is in the Psalms that we pray in the morning hour. First hour. And I love this verse and it really hits me. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse me from secret faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Don't let them have dominion over me. He says, cleanse me from the things that I'm not even aware of. The things that I'm not seeing. That I'm doing as we pray knowingly and unknowingly. Secretly and openly. Hidden and manifest. Cleanse me from every single Sin in my life because I know eventually it will come up. He says, and then cleanse me from the presumptuous sins. The small ones. How many times do you ask God to cleanse you from the small ones? Because we'll look at the last two lines. He says, when you do, then I'll be blameless. And I will be innocent of what? Great transgressions. Because the little ones lead to the great transgressions. Do not consider small sins, small sins. Consider them as big, ugly, hairy, soul-killing sins. So where do we start? Where do we start? There's two things in order for us to move forward. I know repentance was spoken of last week. In order for us to get better, to become like Christ, it requires a thorough examination. A thorough examination of your soul. I've given you two sheets. One of them, it looks like a list where there are some things on the left and some things on the right. I found this in a book. We discussed it in our small group, and I want everyone to have their own copy. The idea is that the list on the right is the mind of Christ. And you look at it, and you're like, wow, he's those things? And you're like, oh, I'm not too far. Then you look at the other side, and you say, wait a minute. I actually think I'm closer to the left. Well, sometimes when you only look at the good, you say, oh, I'm not too bad. But when you look at the left, you say, oh, man, I'm way far from where I need to be. I would like everyone to use this in your prayers this week. I would like everyone to take five or ten minutes to pray about it and circle on that sheet, where do you think you lie? Then I wrote on your sheets, the other sheets, There's a great thing I would like you to look up. It's called A Lament for Sin by St. Basil the Great. Every time I feel like I'm growing spiritually, I read that. It makes me want to fall on the ground. (laughs) 
and go underneath the ground. It humbles me. And when I think I'm doing okay, I'm getting closer to Christ, it begins to expose all the weeds that are in me. And I realize what state my soul really is in. And it drives me to repentance. Because it, it reveals into me the things that I don't see, which are the small sins. I can't tell you how important it is. The first step is the thorough examination. Step number two is to identify the foxes. Identify the foxes. There's this verse in Song of Solomon. Catch us the foxes, the little foxes that spoil the vines, for our vines have tender grapes. The idea is there's this vine that's producing great fruit. It's growing and it's starting to become beautiful. As we do in our spiritual life, we begin to acquire virtues. We begin to look like Christ. And there are the foxes that are hiding in their holes, in the bushes. And they're hiding and they come when you least expect it. They're the small sins that I don't know that we pay attention to that come and they drag us down quickly. And so the thing is to identify the foxes. And these are almost like the gateway sins. You've heard of gateway drugs where you start off with a small drug and it leads to something bigger? These are the gateway sins. There's lots of them. The prayer cards we passed out today are this prayer. A lot of Orthodox churches pray this prayer during Lent every day. Sometimes they do 12 prostrations before, sometimes people do a prostration after each sentence. But I love this prayer. And I think it really kind of hits the spot of where